If you were going to sail 7,500 miles to the Pacific Northwest, which route would you choose and how long do you think it might take? Well, that's exactly what we've got to do. We've got to sail through pirates, monsoons, typhoons, fogs, and goodness knows what else the Pacific's going to throw at us because our patrons decided to send us there via Japan last month. When we announced that we were going to Japan, we had an absolute barrage of questions and comments, both here on YouTube and on Patreon and our social media. Most people were wondering things like, why don't you pop in on Hawaii? And can you go and see Taiwan on the way and even drop in on the Russian coast? Also, why weren't we going to be leaving until next April? It's now March 2018, but we were giving 20, 19 as the start date. Now I'm hoping that by showing you how you have to plan for a passage of this length that you'll understand why some of those things are just not an option. So we've got six and a half thousand miles if we go to Alaska and seven and a half thousand miles if we go to Victoria and we won't make that decision probably until we've left Japan. It's going to depend on the sea conditions and what's going on across the Pacific. There are three things specifically which we need to address. Most important weather. Typhoons, they are seasonal to a certain extent. Monsoons are definitely seasonal. So those kinds of things are going to dictate the general shape of the passage. I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a minute. In this part of the world, it's a well-known fact that the Malacca Strait is prone to piracy, but it tends not to really affect the yachting community. We've been through twice and haven't felt threatened in any way. You just hug the coast of Malaysia and Singapore as you go through. In the southern Philippines, there has been some very dangerous and nasty um, activity. So the area around the Celebes and Sulu Seas needs to be avoided, particularly the southeast. The other thing, obviously, politically, it's more about visas because we've found over the years <laughs> that countries can change their minds very, very quickly on whether you're allowed to have a visa and how long you can stay somewhere. For instance, when we were in India, every time we went back to the UK, and we were there for nearly three years, every time we went back, we would have to fill in different forms, be offered different visas for different lengths of stay, depending on how the Indian and the British governments were getting on with each other at the time. For us, we have the added problem in that we have a cat on board. So Millie is welcome in most countries, but in, but in some, it's just too risky to take her because the quarantine requirements are way beyond what we can manage. We don't want her to go off the boat. We don't want her to go into quarantine. So Australia, New Zealand, UK, we all know they're out. I believe she wouldn't be allowed into Hawaii either. The good news is with Japan, we can take her to Japan, which does have very strict requirements, but as long as she stays on the boat, we're okay. Maybe it's a good time just to talk about the fact that we're going east. This may not mean anything to some of you, but a lot of you who are sailors or even circumnavigators will know that the traditional way of going round the world circumnavigating is west. And this is simply because the currents, the trade winds and the weather patterns all help you to make it a much more comfortable and more doable route. Now going east is possible, but a lot of the time you're fighting upwind and your weather windows between each area are much, much smaller. So the first thing I do whenever we start something as big as this is to consult Jimmy Cornell's World Cruising Routes. It is the Bible for world cruisers and it paints the broad picture for getting around the world across oceans on the bigger passages. So we start with that and then we work and drill down into the smaller areas. I've already been in touch with some people who've done part of this passage and I'm in touch with local people who um, can give us a little bit more local information. There are plenty also of blog spots out there by sailors who are circumnavigating. Not so many on the east side of things, but there are one or two, so I'm in contact with them as well. At the moment, we don't have any paper charts for these areas, but we will be getting them soon. We tend to buy small-scale large area charts and use those to plot our waypoints and our passage. So when I first started to look at this passage, I didn't have any knowledge of the area at all. All I had was Cornell's routes and some timings. To get from Malaysia then, and miss out Borneo and the southern part of the Philippines is a long journey. 
and I decided that we should bite the bullet and go straight to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, go perhaps via Taiwan to Japan and then straight off to the Pacific Northwest. Seemed like a good idea at the time and I did speak to someone who made that journey last year. He said it was very arduous and very uphill. Going particularly off the coast of Vietnam, there are a lot of fishing vessels. We think we've got them here. He said it's nothing compared to Vietnam. And also they will string out floating nets for 10 miles, which you can't see at night. So not an area that you really want to be doing too much in the way of ocean crossing. So that was number one, but that faded uh, when I looked at the possibility of going to the Philippines because it's a really beautiful place and we'd love to get there if we can. So number two was to go across to Borneo from Malaysia, head round the top of Borneo and then perhaps drop down into Sulawesi and spend a little bit of time in Indonesia, a country that, which we love before then heading to the southern part of the Philippines. Now, there are conflicting reports on just how dangerous it is, but we all know of kidnappings and indeed beheadings in this part of the world. And it looked to me at one stage that this might be okay, but having spoken to a few people who are there and who were there during the time when it was very bad, I've decided that it's a risk that we do not want to take. So we'll be avoiding that area. So that knocks out the northeast side of Borneo and dropping down to uh, Sulawesi. At the moment I'm on route number three which again takes us across to Borneo via the Anambas which will be great and then we'll spend a little bit of time in Borneo before we head to the Philippines and at the moment unofficially Palawan has been declared a safe zone. There is a great deal of marine traffic, um, security traffic there keeping the seas safe. So as long as we stay on the west side, perhaps the west side of Palawan itself, and travel to the middle of the Philippines from Borneo, it does look like a viable option. So at the moment, this is the one in the lead. Having got to the Philippines, we'll manage a couple of months there before going to Japan and then on to the Pacific Northwest. During our smaller passages, as you've seen uh, around uh, Southeast Asia, when we passage plan, we tend to look at the destination first. So do we need to arrive there at night? Do we prefer to get there on uh, slack tide? Perhaps you need to go through a channel, perhaps you need a rising tide. All these factors uh, were taken into consideration when we, uh, for, for, where, for our arrival point. And then that dictates when we leave. And in, to a certain extent, it's somewhat similar for these large passages. We're not too worried about tides and so forth on the, on the very long passages but we need to know the date at which we need to launch for those passages. So if you start with Japan and work backwards, you'll see using those little windows when you have to leave and when you have to get there. So there are four points at which we have to make a decision on date. The first one is, when do we cross from Malaysia to get to Borneo? The second one, what's the best time to leave Borneo to reach the Philippines? And then Philippines to Japan, there's only a small window, can we make it? And then finally, the departure date from Japan across the Pacific. So we'll start with Japan then. Cornell says that if you're gonna to go to Alaska from Japan, you need to be leaving around June or July. If you're going to make your destination Victoria, BC, then you can leave it until August, so July, August for that destination. This time of the year in the summer is the preferred time for going on that very long North Pacific route. The biggest risk in this area clearly is going to be typhoons, which is why the window is quite small because there are fewer than but they still exist. So there is great weather reporting in Japan and we'll, we'll be monitoring that carefully. And also the Coast Guard, I'm told, are very, very helpful. They help you with the Curacao current, which takes you very quickly, if you get it right, out of Japan, heading east. This is what you need to do because you want to make as much easting as you can to get away from the worst of the weather. So we'll be talking to the Coast Guard at the time and waiting for the, exactly the best window we can find when we leave, probably from somewhere around Yokohama. So to get to Japan, we have to leave the Philippines. This is quite a dangerous area, the Philippines. It's well known for typhoons pretty much all year round. We understand from Cornell that you should be leaving around May. So you can take a couple of routes in the open sea straight across to Nagasaki or Osaka. But if you want to leave a little earlier, you can. You can go to Okinawa, one of the southern islands, which just allows you a little bit more leeway. 
Borneo to Philippines is an interesting one because the window for that is pretty much the same as the Philippines to Japan. However, you can go a little earlier. We'll be leaving Borneo and heading up the coast along uh, Palawan, either to the west or the east. We'll make that decision nearer the time, depending on the security situation. We have a friend at the moment, and this is only March 2018, looking to leave right now, and another boat is already on its way. So it's all about trying to get to north, pretty much north, slightly northeast to the Philippines in the northeast monsoon. There are weather windows and towards the end of the monsoon it does die down. The first part of the journey is going to take us from Malaysia to Borneo via the Anambas and there really is only one time of the year you can do this and that's during the southwest monsoon. It doesn't really start kicking in until May and we will probably be going June or July depending on where we are with preparations for the boat. So in a nutshell, this is the current plan. Tiaman to Borneo via the Anambas, we depart June, August. We remain in Borneo, cruising Sarawak and Sabah for around seven months. Then we leave Borneo to get to the Philippines around March. We remain in Philippines for around two months and depart to Japan in May. We remain in Japan for around two months and depart for the Pacific Northwest in July. So what could change? anything and everything who knows we may get to the philippines decide it's so lovely we need to stay there for longer we might need to stay there for a year we could get to japan and think the same although the problem with japan is that you will be there for over a year and there isn't a great deal of cruising during that time we've also got to think about millie so yeah anything can change at any time so you may have noticed if you've done some quick calculations that we had intended to leave around april 2019 but if all goes well here with the boat prep we could be leaving this year in June or July. Let's see, let's cross everything and hope that we get everything done. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and perhaps learned something from it. I'm sure we're going to learn something from you. Please put your comments below. We read every one. Like it, share it, comment, subscribe, do all those things. In the meantime, peace and fair winds.